He's a Jewish Institute for National Security Affairs. It's a pro-U.S. defense organization. Been around since 1976. I came on board about two years ago. Um, we uh, we do a lot. We do uh, do a number of programs with the U.S. military. We also do a bunch with the Israeli military. We believe that a strong U.S. Israel security relationship is important to a strong United States. Um, when uh, the Gaza war happened uh, last summer, uh, we were thinking, and we I reached out, we reached out to a few the generals in our network, uh, retired, and we thought we came up with the idea of trying to put together a group of retired generals, U.S. generals, uh, who were very engaged in uh, recent wars, very have very concrete uh, experience with commanders in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan involved in the wars. Uh, to do an independent assessment of how uh, Israel conducted itself and uh, what are the implications for U.S. national security. Because I think we see often uh, what premieres in Israel uh, often comes to a theater near us. And there's uh, a lot that we can learn, good and bad, from what happened, what, what Israel does, what it confronts, and what are the lessons for us as we face our own uh, fights with in, uh, against terrorists in, uh, in urban environments and so on. So uh, we put out in, on March 9th, uh, we have uh, we put out we have the reports out there. Oh, um, and uh, we put out a report on March 9th. Uh, I mean, they put out the report. We just got uh, And uh, the, the guys are uh, the gentlemen been kind enough to come here today and tomorrow to do some briefings uh, with some members. So we put together very last minute this lunch uh, for you all. Thank you very much for coming. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over. Uh, I'll just quickly. I'm going to turn over to General Caldwell, and uh, but I'll just say a quick word about each of them. Uh, General Caldwell, retired general. I remember him not depending on briefly because I made a both uh, say both. He was among other commands. He was uh, also our spoke the, the U.S. military spokesperson uh, in Iraq for 13 months. Uh, General Devereaux, uh, Air Force General, uh, what was the exact last title? Head of the uh, Oper uh, Operational plan Planning Policy and Strategy at Headquarters Air Force. Thank you very much, General <laughs> uh, Mike Jones. As you know that by heart by now, but who could remember that such a long time? General uh, uh, Mike Jones. Uh, Former Chief of Staff at CENTCOM, also a commander in Cyber City, New York, uh, among other commands in the Army. And we also, we had two other generals, uh, General Chuck Wall, retired, former Deputy Commander of the U.S. Uh, European Command, and also the head of the Air War in Afghanistan at the beginning. And General uh, Natansky, Rich Natansky, retired Marine General, was also a former commander in Fallujah. We also had two uh, really important uh, advisors to the uh, to the group, uh, and one of them is here today, uh, Jeff Korn, Professor Korn, a former JAG, Lieutenant Colonel, really an expert of laws of armed conflict. I, I'll admit, when we, this thing went on, the issue of laws of armed conflict became increasingly important, uh, and Jeff has been terrific uh, on that, you'll hear him. Uh, we also had uh, uh, Ellie Cohn, uh, Professor at SAIS, heads the Strategic Studies Department there, also a, a prominent military historian and also uh, a former senior official in the State Department. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to General. We go sit down. I think I make this kind of informal to General Caldwell. Well, here, I'll just stand so you can see in the back for a second. I, uh, I, okay. I, I came out of the Army for 37 years in service about 18 months ago. Currently president of uh, Georgia Military College, obviously down in the state of uh, Georgia right now. So moved into education from the Armed Forces. Uh, I, I think what was key for me when, when I was asked if, if I would be a part of this group to go to Israel last December was it was an opportunity to do an assessment of something that happened last year, last summer, uh, that conflict that occurred over there, and come back and yet we were going to look and see if, you know, what happened, did, did in fact perhaps uh, the Israeli defense forces violate the laws of modern conflict, was there something uh, that occurred there, or what really did happen? But more importantly is, what are the lessons to be learned for the United States military? I, you may have known one of my three-star jobs, I headed up all the training and education for the Army uh, under the Army's Training and Doctrine Command. And uh, so we had a lessons learned element there that for two and a half years I, I ran. 
And so we're always looking for and trying to understand what is the future perhaps going to look like versus, you know, we live in the past. And this was the most recent conflict that occurred that I think the United States military can learn from. So it was intriguing for the opportunity to go over there and be able to talk to many different folks from different sides uh, to gain a better perspective of what occurred. Out of that, we wrote a report. And uh, what was key is we didn't want to be constricted to have to go one way or the other. We weren't trying to defend anybody or support anybody. It was rather what was our assessment. Uh, we wanted to have that independence as a group of uh, uh, senior military people, former senior military people that went over there. Uh, we looked at it and came back and said there's probably four areas you can break this report into. There's an uh, area of hybrid warfare, there's a technology, there's an information, and then there's the law of armed conflict. The four of us will briefly talk on each of those. I'll talk hybrid just for a second, and then open it up again towards Q&A and let you all ask whatever questions you want to ask. But under the hybrid piece, uh, there's no question that Hamas has taken and developed a very uh, conventional type of army. Uh, they have six of these kind of brigades of that are over there that have good capabilities, just like any other U.S. military force would have in an armed formation. They're well-trained, they're well-equipped, and they're prepared to fight. Uh, they also use unconventional type of tactics, too. And we'll talk a little about under the technology. But, but so it's not like we went up against somebody who was just in a regular kind of force. They actually had a well-prepared, well-developed, uh, very capable military force. But it's a non-state actor. Hamas is, you know, not a uh, recognized international um, governing nation. And so it's a non-state actor who can use conventional forces and irregular type forces to take on the Israelis. But what's interesting, whereas we, the United States military, go in to win a conflict, we go in to be decisive in our actions. They, on the other hand, went in to be decisive in terms of winning the information to the They had no intent to ever try to defeat the Israelis militarily. That was never their intent. They never went in to make the Israelis um, uh, capitulate and pull them what, what they wanted to do. And so they were able to employ this hybrid type of uh, tactics and uh, capabilities against the Israelis to gain a tremendous international um, strategic advantage in terms of the information they made and how they employ those forces. Thanks, Bill. Uh, again, Rick Devereaux, uh, 35 years Air Force. Uh, currently live in Asheville, North Carolina. Congressman Mark Meadows is my congressman. I don't know if any, he's on foreign affairs. I don't know if anybody here is in his office. But, uh, in any case, I kind of want to talk just a few minutes on technology because as John Caldwell mentioned, this sort of hybrid threat, Hamas, was employing fairly conventional military capabilities uh, that involved the use of technology in very innovative ways, not necessarily high-tech technology, but technology nonetheless. First area was one you're all familiar with, the rocket threat. Uh, launched about 6,000 rockets against Israel. Uh, most of which either fell harmlessly in Israel because of the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the ability of the Israelis to detect uh, where the rockets were heading, uh, or were intercepted by the Iron Dome system very effectively. Uh, what's interesting though, people focus on, you know, the IDF has this incredible defensive shield. Why are they worried about a rocket threat? Well, if you look to the north, Hezbollah, uh, reportedly has rockets not in the thousands, but in the hundreds of thousands. Uh, in fact, if you look at the Hezbollah's uh, rocket missile forces, it exceeds what the UK, Italy, and France have combined. Uh, so, some real questions in the future about whether a defense shield like Iron Dome is going to be really anything more than a, uh, an initial sort of uh, sphere of defense against that kind of threat. Second area was of technology was tunnels. Uh, as you know, Hamas uh, very effectively used tunnels, some three dozen for a multitude of purposes. Uh, and that was one of uh, Israel's strategic objectives was to go after these tunnels because they, they allowed Hamas to hide its uh, rocket and missile rocket forces, uh, protect its command and control capabilities, uh, do uh, sort of uh, 
rear uh, behind enemy lines kind of uh, incursions into Israel. So uh, Hamas really, in, 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 once the, the tunnels were detected, uh, uh, the IDF, us, as we went in there afterwards, found out that they were much uh, more extensive, much more sophisticated. These are not just, you know, hollowed out of the ground, uh, concrete reinforced with uh, water lines, electrical lines, uh, in some cases uh, computer lines. Uh, that went through. So, uh, uh, you know, our military, of course, thinks in terms of air, land, sea, space, cyber domains. Now, we really, one implication of this conflict is to think about the subterranean uh, domain as an active uh, domain of war, particularly in urban areas where uh, Targeting and discrimination with civilians is very difficult, and then you add this tunnel element, and it really can complicate matters. So, one of the uh, the report's recommendations is that we really, in terms of the U.S. military, have to get after better technologies for tunnel detection uh, using airborne sensors, ideally, and also for uh, uh, tunnel incapacitation, because the IDF had to go in, and it took them weeks to get after every one of these tunnels, and it's not that easy to sort of uh, bring down a tunnel, if you will, and lots of ground forces, and lots of rather uh, uh, sort of brute force methods to, to take down a tunnel. So that's something, that's, that's a big takeaway for us. Other few interesting technologies that were employed by Hamas, uh, UAVs. First time that we saw, again, a non-state actor employ UAVs in a conflict. The IDF was able to defend successfully, shot down the, the, the couple of UAVs that Hamas used, but that's kind of an alarm bell for us in terms of UAV defense networks, not something that we've uh, had to sort of uh, address, but something that, that we will have to as a result of this conflict. Another area that uh, Hamas used uh, for the first time was uh, special ops forces, SEAL-like forces that were using sort of bubble-free technology, sending swimmers uh, into uh, maritime areas. Uh, again, the IDF was able to intercept these guys effectively, but uh, you know, again, it's not something we normally have to address with uh, terrorists or insurgent groups, is these kind of special operators, highly trained, with technology that, that prevent that allows them to go undetected. And then the last area is kind of a pretty basic technology, but one that Hamas used very effectively was mortars. Uh, Iron Dorm Dome is obviously going to have a hard time defending against a mortar that has a time from uh, launch to impact of 15 seconds or so. Uh, so uh, having the right kind of detection technologies as well as uh, close-in weapons that can counter mortar fire, uh, phalanx type systems uh, is, is been a focus of our military. I think this, this uh, conflict has kind of shown that we need to put a little bit more in terms of resources on those technology areas. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to Mike to talk about information operations. Yeah, and, and I think, uh, again, the, the focus of the report was what are the implications uh, for the U.S. Uh, in the future conflict, and I think uh, quite a few of you are uh, members of the, of, or have members of the uh, Foreign Relations Committee or an interest there as part of your portfolio, so I think the information piece might be particularly important to you. Uh, the, the first thing that we uh, noticed was uh, kind of real dilemma, I wonder why this happened, and that was, it was clear to us as folks who've been engaged in combat uh, and have applied uh, combat power in accordance with the law of armed conflict, the law of war, uh, that is the, is the IDF had the kinds of systems in place and so forth to ensure uh, that they were uh, abiding by the law of armed conflict in terms of how they were applying force, how they did their targeting procedures very similar to ours and so forth. Uh, it was just as uh, clear to us uh, that Hamas habitually violated uh, the law of armed conflict in terms of two things. One is by virtue of the targeting, where most of the targets they were shooting at with rockets and mortars were, were civilian targets and had absolutely no military value whatsoever, clearly a violation of the law of armed conflict. Uh, the other thing was by virtue of, of where they positioned 
uh, their firing positions and command and control headquarters and so forth. Again, with absolutely no military necessity to do so, they put them in places that clearly jeopardized uh, you know, civilians who were in the area and in key sensitive sites like UN compounds and mosques and so forth. Uh, so, so given that circumstance, why was it that in the international media uh, you know, that it appeared uh, that uh, Israel was very heavily criticized for not taking sufficient care to prevent uh, civilian casualties, uh, and, and at the same time, uh, in, and in some cases, violating uh, the law of war, uh, and to include criticism from our State Department, and at the same time, Hamas you know, almost got packed. I mean, there was not a lot of criticism. And so why did that happen? It comes down to a, a couple fundamental things. First of all, Hamas did have a very effective information campaign. Uh, they used uh, the public information piece by virtue of how they limited uh, where journalists could go and the images that could go out and so forth uh, to portray their story very effectively. Uh, in their message. Uh, they also did a very good job of using social media, where they tailored their messages to different audiences, series of messages to the, to the Arab audiences, other messages to Western audiences, and so forth. And in both of those cases, their messages were not countered effectively in the international domain by the Israelis. And so why was that? We came down to a couple fundamental issues. Uh, the first is what I would call the uh, resource to, or the capability to responsibility mismatch. And that is, uh, the Israeli Defense Forces actually have a pretty good information uh, campaign apparatus. But when we talked to those folks, they uh, said that their target audiences were uh, the uh, soldiers, the sailors, the airmen of the IDF themselves, and the Israeli domestic population. Uh, the international audience is the responsibility of the foreign ministry. We talked to the foreign ministry folks, they said, well, you know, we have responsibility for the international audience, but we don't have the capability to really be able to engage the international audience and, and to be able to counter uh, these uh, the Hamas message. Uh, and, and we have the same issue uh, in, in the U.S., and that is uh, we have the Department of Defense has some pretty good information ops capability, but it's limited to only being able to use it against our enemies, and, and we can't even really figure out who the enemy is. And so, so we, we have that problem, and the responsibility for the international community relies with the Department of State. And the Department of State doesn't have the capability uh, to do those kinds of information operations, so therefore uh, we're not being successful in countering our potential, or in many cases our current enemies, uh, uh, messaging that they're doing. Now, ISIS is the most prominent example, but there, there are lots of others. And so you have that mismatch of, of capability. The other thing is, uh, it's almost philosophical, and that is, I, typically we think of information operations as military guys as a supporting arm uh, to our military campaign. So if we think of it like that, uh, just like air support and other kinds of supporting things to military campaigns. The, uh, I think that the, I've concluded the way that Hamas looks at it is it's not a supporting effort. The reality is the fight, the, the, the campaign, is an information campaign. And the supporting piece is military action. Uh, they want to achieve military, they want to achieve uh, information outcomes, and they use military force in order to facilitate that, uh, not in order to achieve a military outcome. And, and if we're going to fight enemies and think like that, we have to come to resolution on how we're going to engage in this information domain. Uh, and then the last area is the, the issue of social media, and that is it was effectively used by the mosques, it's being used by our enemies, and, and we still have not figured out exactly what is the role, uh, the proper way to do it, the limitations and so forth, of how our government should use uh, the uh, social media side of this in order to counter uh, our enemies' uh, propaganda and messaging against us. So uh, we need to come to grips with that as well. Uh, and then all of that kind of revolves around the exploitation of a, a lack of understanding about the law of armed conflict. Uh, and I'd like to ask Jeff to make a few comments about that. I just do it from sitting down, if it's okay. I want to be very brief because in case some of you have questions. I was asked to provide um, the legal expertise for these commanders as they looked at the uh, conduct of the Israeli campaign and then considered the implications for future U.S. military operations. 
And I think the most important thing, there are a couple of really important points to take out of it, but perhaps the most important is this, the, the symbolism of the fact that these are warfighting commanders uh, offering their views on the proper relationship between law and military operations. I think too frequently today, uh, international law and the laws of war are viewed primarily as a lawyer domain. In fact, they are a commander's domain because those are the rules that frame the legality, legitimacy, and conduct of military operations. And it is just, uh, it's just axiomatic that military forces of democracies are going to have to follow these rules no matter who their enemy is. In, as a matter of fact, if you think about it, the last war where there probably was reciprocal respect for the rules of war, I, I think probably was the Falklands War in 1982 when the British fought the Argentinians. Every conflict since then has been what we might call an asymmetrical application of the law, where you have one party that's trying to follow the rules and another party that doesn't care about the rules. This is the reality of future warfare uh, for the U.S. Armed Forces and for all professional armed forces. And so there are great lessons to learn from the Israeli experience on how to cope with this reality. So the notion that a, a professional armed force would fight an enemy that doesn't care about rules is not necessarily new. I think that's been an aspect of, of warfare for centuries. What is new is the point that General Jones emphasized that you're dealing with enemies that are sophisticated enough to know that they can exploit that asymmetry to gain both a strategic advantage in the information and international relations domain and a tactical advantage in the fight itself by exploiting their enemies' respect for the law in an effort to neuter the combat power that overwhelms them. And this is what the report refers to and discusses. How do you deal with that? <clears throat> well, the option of saying if they're not following rules, we don't have to follow rules, is simply illogical and it's never going to happen. Uh, the forces of the Israeli military, our military, NATO militaries are going to have to follow the rules of war. What is critical is that those rules be understood by the external audience that is critiquing the conduct of military operations and also by the force itself. And so the report uh, really focuses on the reality versus the misperception of the law. That the law of armed conflict provides ample, uh, what we might call maneuver space for commanders to achieve their military objectives. Even when they're dealing with an enemy that's abusing the law and exploiting the presence of civilians in an effort to prevent its opponent from achieving its military goals. But that also requires a very careful distinction between cause of civilian harm and responsibility for civilian war. And this, I think, is one of the great dangers of contemporary warfare, is that it is too easy to rely on emotive media images of civilian suffering to automatically assume that the party to the conflict that inflicted the suffering is ipso facto responsible for the suffering. Cause and responsibility are not the same thing. If, if, a, if an American military commander orders an artillery strike, against an enemy rocket position that's embedded in a civilian community and it causes civilian casualties, obviously the artillery attack caused the casualties. But the responsibility for those casualties is very likely at the hands of the opponent that deliberately put that rocket system in the midst of the civilian population. And there was actually a report released uh, for the, on behalf of the Secretary General last week that was very critical of the uh, UN facilities in Gaza for allowing Hamas to exploit them as a location for their military assets and the risk that that created the civilian population. So I think that it is imperative for the US military as we continue to confront this type of hybrid enemy, uh, which in, in conflict areas that will increasingly be urban, right? and that will increasingly necessitate the traditional method of defeating an enemy. Putting your boots on the ground and closing with that enemy to engage in close combat. And I think the, the Gaza operation reveals that there's a myth out there that sophisticated militaries can win every fight from the air or from a standoff capability. 
You're fighting an enemy that knows that's your capability, so they are going to be adaptive and look for methods to prevent those assets from striking at their, their center of gravity. And that's going to necessitate putting boots on the ground. That's what the Israelis confronted. They had to destroy the tunnels. They had to destroy the, the resources for the rockets. They couldn't rely only on defensive capability because what worked yesterday might not work tomorrow. And so it requires close combat in an urban environment against an enemy that's going to be do, doing everything possible to complicate your attack decisions by commingling with the civilian population. We have to understand the law. We have to understand that it allows for the conduct of hostilities in those environments. We have to understand that the law tolerates, maybe hard to accept, but it tolerates a certain degree of civilian casualties in the execution of legitimate military operations. And we have to be very careful not to assume that rules of engagement, which are policy limitations placed on otherwise lawful uses of force by a commander for operational mission accomplishment reasons, right? The, the most, the, the one that we learned about in uh, grade school, don't fire till you see the whites of their eyes. That was a rule of engagement on the top of Breed's Hill. The commander could have said fire when they're at the bottom of the hill, but he chose not to because it would gain an advantage by restraining that otherwise lawful conduct. That is a ubiquitous aspect of contemporary military operations, but it's tailored to the mission. And what's happening too frequently is a conflation between law and policy constraints. And when we impose policy constraints, we have to be very clear that they are mission-specific, and they might not necessarily match up to the next mission. So the fact that we might authorize more robust <coughs> use of force in a different context is not a reflection of illegality. It's simply a reflection of tailoring the authority to the mission itself. So more clarity on the law, the rules, and the space it provides commanders to deal with this type of enemy is essential, not only for the information domain, but also for the forces themselves. So they have a very clear understanding of the left and right limits for their use of force against this type of inevitably complicated enemy. Does anyone have any uh, questions Yes, uh, a couple of things. First, on the issue of Hamas, uh, UAVs and special forces, where did they get those UAVs and who gave them training for special forces? And the other question for anyone, if they want to answer it, um, there's some political criticism in Israel that the government didn't do enough to destroy Hamas. Is that a valid criticism? Is, the, is there such a thing as destroying Hamas within that context? I, I'll start on that one. I think if you look at the report, the report is focused on the operational and tactical domain of, the, of, of action. The strategic judgment of political leaders as to what they define as the mission for the military is, is outside the scope of rules of engagement, the law of armed conflict. Uh, I don't think that the report really addresses it. Okay. In, in our report, one of the things we say is that the, uh, the objectives uh, of the Israelis were relatively tactical, but they they uh, uh, they had really a couple major objectives. One of which was they wanted to degrade Hamas, uh, but they did not want uh, to destroy Hamas. And that and that the reason is what is, what comes next? You know, the, the Palestinian Authority do, does not have the ability to take over in Gaza and to rule the place and to run it. Uh, and so not knowing what will come next, a weakened Hamas still uh, being the authority there was better than the alternative of no Hamas and not knowing what comes next. So I, I, I don't criticize that personally. I think that's probably a valid uh, way to look at that. Uh, in terms of the second issue, uh, we, we don't have any first-hand information. Uh, what we were told was the, uh, uh, the underwater breathers uh, that allow them to do the uh, infiltration up the coast. Uh, in training came out of uh, Iran. Uh, would not be surprising to me personally, uh, given uh, uh, the Cuts Force and, and uh, concern about uh, the Straits of Hormuz and, and the Arabian Gulf and that kind of business. 
uh, in terms of the UAVs, I don't think that we've heard of a source of where those UAVs work, but frankly, you can go down here to any store, uh, you know, hobby shop, and buy what is essentially a UAV and, and uh, you know, make that work. So I, I don't think the source of the UAV piece, because there, uh, there are so many platforms out there you can use, and then you can put up, you know, various kinds of cameras, or for that matter, even munitions on them to make a ball. Send to. Uh, so I don't think the source is so much an issue as the proliferation of them that I think is the issue. Yeah. Following on uh, that answer, can you get into it? There's expected to be a, a bond deal by the end of June, maybe sometime in the summer, which would uh, not only provide a lot of cash to the Iranians, but would sort of begin the process of normalizing them. Can you game out what that would mean in terms of the equipment or training? Or capability to that eventually to be for Hamas, given the fact that it looks like the underwear group that came from Iran. You, you hear all the time about the Iranian connection. No, I could, but I won't because okay. that's beyond the scope of I know what study, and, and I, I think we want to always be that <laughs> But you know what? I'll, I'll just make, make an end of this. But I think it's a valid concern, and you know, one thing that uh, people often did looking at this Hamas conflict is they looked at it in isolation and didn't look at the second and third order consequences, especially with respect to Hezbollah in the north, which is obviously receiving support from uh, both Syria and from Iran. So everything that the IDF did, they, they weren't just concerned about the current conflict, they had to think about deterrence and sending a signal for you know, potential uh, adversaries in the north. So, uh, yeah, I mean, anytime you lift an embargo, you're going to probably increase the probability that uh, not only legal goods can travel, but that illegal weapons and so forth can travel. So, I don't really think that you could make that inference pretty clearly. I was wondering if you might be able to talk to give any uh, some of your views on the ICC proceedings and kind of how we could be thinking about that here going forward, what you, uh, given what you guys found in your report. Uh, you know, I, I think that the, the U.S. policy of having us administer the law for our forces uh, is the right policy, and I would recommend that we stay with that. I think trying to turn over uh, responsibility for adjudication uh, of, of that kind of uh, thing to some international body, uh, especially an international body that isn't necessarily educated or experienced in conflict, uh, would be a mistake for the United States to do that. Uh, and so I, you know, I think our policy is right, and I think the policies of uh, other modern militaries probably ought to be aligned with. Yeah, I, I, I just jump right on that. Um, I, I cannot imagine asking young men and women in combat to have to make uh, very difficult and challenging decisions instantaneously with the best information they currently have in front of them. Let's always have threat afterwards of who's going to come and look at that and make some determination who worked there on the ground, who didn't understand what was occurring every day, who weren't living and breathing and seeing, you know, perhaps American men and women being shot and killed next to them, and then make that decision to launch that missile into that building that could potentially have civilians in there, recognizing they've just lost three soldiers next to them who are now lying on the ground dying. And another six or seven could be very quickly right behind that, say, put that precision munitions right in that building. Um, to have that second guess time and time again. Um, you know, it would just be incredibly scary to me to ask. And, and as a Bosnian veteran, I, you know, where the International Criminal Court was important, uh, I, I think there actually is a role uh, for institutions like the ICC when it comes to genocide and, and for the kinds of things that is appropriate for, for them to address. Uh, but I think that the tactical uh, you know, operational decision making and so forth, that it just isn't one of those things that ought to be part of their purview. You know, Mike said that what plays in Israel sometimes, premieres in Israel sometimes plays in the U.S. 
how the ICC deals with this uh, Palestinian request to investigate uh, actions is going to be a very, very significant bellwether on the credibility of the court going forward. The, the, and, and, and actually, I think that the primary focus of that is going to be occupation issues and not conduct of hostilities issues, the type of issues that were uh, pr primarily focused on in the report. Having said that, uh, the, the fundamental principle of the ICC is complementarity, which means that some of the information in the report you would think would be relevant to the consideration of whether to pursue investigations because the report talked about the fact that the generals were briefed on current ongoing investigations uh, into the IDF personnel by their own military advocate general. And that's the way the system's supposed to work. The system is supposed to work by giving the state and the commanders and the armed forces uh, their own, um, basically, primary responsibility to deal with issues of potential misconduct in warfare. And that's happening in Israel right now. As a matter of fact, the Israeli military structure is even more independent than the U.S. structure. When I was a JAG, I worked for a commander. The military advocate general in Israel is a commander. He doesn't work for the chief of staff of the army. The only person he reports to is the attorney general of the state. So they've created a structure that has significant independence. And I think that you know, it, would be, it would be a real risk to the credibility of the ICC for the prosecutor to prematurely assume that the Israeli military is incapable of investigating its own incidents of misconduct. And one of the reasons for that is, and all of these generals will confirm this, there's probably nobody with a stronger interest in identifying and responding to issues of misconduct in warfare than the warfighting commander himself, because it affects the discipline and the readiness of that force. So let the system work, and before we assume it can't work, let's see what the outcomes are. I think uh, we'll end now. Uh, thank you very much for all your time and uh, look forward to it. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, Oh, yeah. If, I could, if you all didn't catch, let me just say one thing. If you didn't catch the one comment uh, that General Jones made, it was really important. The fact that the military force was used to support an information campaign by Hamas is actually a real change in how. Uh, potential adversaries we may face in the future may try to operate against U.S. military uh, operations. Uh, in fact, they won't really worry about taking us on militarily. They'll want to only take us on in the information domain, and they'll just use their military to support their information objectives, uh, which will dramatically change and alter how we will have to operate and think, not only as a military, but especially as a nation. Uh, and what we say and do, and how our policymakers set the objectives for what they want us to accomplish. Yeah, we'll let you all be the judge of who won the information in that campaign. Um, so, uh, thanks again for coming. If you have further questions for the generals and, uh, and uh, Professor Korn, please uh, contact us and also, uh, of course, in your future business events. Thank you.